All right, welcome to Muse 360, week six, day one. It's the real Dr. Dre, DJ Food Stamp, here with one of my kitties. I got three of them <laughs> ripping around the house. They're all awake right now and eating and thrashing, which means they'll be sleeping um, soon. So this is the one we call Sweetie. She's sweet. Yeah, there's a little fuckers. Um, anyways, today we're going to talk about gangster rap. Nothing says gangster rap like a white dude at a farm uh, with kitties. You know, I mean, really, nothing says it. Um, but we're going to talk about, you know, gangster rap. And, um, you know, it's an interesting genre. It's a very conflicting sort of genre. Let's just let's just say that. Um, you know, in many ways, and what I when I talk about this lecture, when I talk about gangster rap, you know, um, it's really important to think about it as a sort of, you know, I mean, I, I talk about it as performance art, you know, because uh, that's what it ends up being in a lot of ways. It's kind of an act, and um, I think you find too, like a lot of, you know. It's ridiculous to assume that what people are talking about on records is real. Just like if you watch a, a horror movie, or any type of movie for that matter, you know, to assume that it's real, that the actors are really these people, um, is just foolish. So, I don't know. Uh, I like to just think about it, you know, um, the politics of, of the music and, and the politics of the music, and then you know, making and marketing gangster rap as a commodity, as a product, um, as a genre. Um, and it's important to look at that, you know, and kind of how, how um, you know, how it's been pimped out, let's just say that, to the very least, you know, by, um, you know, white managers. You know, if, if you know anything about NWA and Jerry Heller and you've watched uh, Straight Outta Compton, the official biopic of the NWA of the NWA, you know, um, you know, you see how, you know, not only is there's the industry that's, you know, profiting off of this type of music and has, um, there's the consumer base, which eventually became largely a white consumer base. And what sort of images it perpetuates um, in, in that audience, and that's something we'll talk about as we kind of get into this, and it's something to really, really think about here um, in, in, a different, in a different way. Now, every time that I, I do this, this talk and talk about this in person, I'm like, yeah, we're going to listen to some Easy e some NWA, you know, uh, all that stuff, you know, and uh, people get really excited, <laughs> like really excited. There's a handful usually of dudes who get really excited, you know, um, and, you know, I get it, you know, when I was younger, this music was really interesting, you know, because I've been a rap head years before, um, you know, when I was real young, and this was just so different, the sound, the, the stories, it was, you know, the, 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 the rhymes about, you know, killing and gore and, and sexual exploits, it was just interesting, you know, um, you know I never heard anything like that. And I was in the horror movies and stuff too, so you know, kind of it kind of clicked with me. Um, I didn't. I was too young to even understand, you know, the social and racial and political and economical imperatives of it all. You know, you, you come to get there later. Um, but if we want to talk about the aesthetics of gangster rap, like I had you listen to everything from, you know, Schooly D. Um, uh, Ice T, NWA, some later Ice Cube solo stuff, some Keras One, um, you know, uh, some of the music that responded in some ways, or some some of the music that went to further address uh, police brutality um, in a, in a different way, you know. Um, and I think you know the way we can. Uh, sort of round up the aesthetics of all of it. You probably listen, hopefully listen to Cop Killer. Um, that's a, by the group Body Count, which was Ice-T's rap rock group. 
And I, and I want to just say this. When I talk about gangster rap as an act, I don't mean that like all of it is, but you start to look at people who are involved in, especially, you know, the, the sort of early era of it in the 80s and 90s, Ice Cube. Ice Cube's an actor, you know what I'm saying? Like, he is an actor now. Like, you know him as an actor. You don't know him as a, as a rapper. He probably ain't made any albums in your lifetime. You, you know what I'm saying? You know him from Disney movies. You know, you know what I mean? You know Ice-T from Law and Order. You know, you know, like, you, you know Tupac, but Tupac was an actor, too. I mean, he went to a performing arts school um, in, I think, in Maryland. I mean, I mean, Pac is from the East Coast. The whole death row thing, you know, was an act. You know, he was in, you know, the movie Juice. He was in uh, Poetic Justice with Janet Jackson. I mean, dude was an actor. Um, and gangster rap, in a lot of ways, is, is an act, you know, it is. It's just a performance, and that's part of the, you know, the issue in some ways. But, uh, you know, if we look at the aesthetics of it, we're, we're getting stories. Like, you know, there was storytelling in, in rap before this, but, like, it took it to the whole new, new level. Um, a lot of these dudes, you know, they were in the hood, and they had friends who were gangbangers, you know, and they told their stories, you know, or they told stories that they had heard, you know, from around the way. And these were like, you know, stories of violence, stories of sexual exploits, all that stuff. In many ways, it was very vivid, you know, uh, names, uh, how they described what they were doing, all that stuff was very vivid and it created a sort of form of verbal cinema. And you could start to picture these things and in your head, you know, um, the language was always, you know, nasty, cussing, lots and lots of cussing, like, cussing wasn't really prominent in a lot of, um, not, not all, but in a lot of 80s rap, uh, you don't hear a lot of cussing, you know, um, and NWA really broke the floodgates open for, um, you know, explicit lyrics, you know what I'm saying? And what were the stories about? I mean, we're talking uh, drugs, drug sales, uh, drug dealing, uh, violence in general, violence against women, robbing, murder, uh, sex, um, and also, you know, talking about some of the social, the social issues um, in the hood, you know, um, which is also a really important part of this. Um, you know, some of the groups and some of the artists addressed racial profiling by the police, police brutality, um, you know, and this was often, this was a prominent theme in a lot of later uh, Ice Cube work, you know, but it wasn't necessarily stuff that everybody addressed, and they weren't exactly, it's hard to look at a lot of quote-unquote gangster, gangster rappers and say that, you know, these cats were, were socially conscious. You know, you look at NWA, and people are like, well, they made you know, a song, Fuck the Police, which is like a, sort of an anthem um, against, you know, against police brutality. But that was kind of it. <laughs> you know, like the social commentary was in, in some of the records of some of the stuff they did, some of the little interludes and stuff that they did. But NWA was not a socially conscious uh, group. You know, they were no public enemy. Um, you know, there were no Boogie Down Productions or KRS-One's la later work, you know, none of that stuff. Um, and that's something to, to, to remember, you know, they were, you know, their rhymes were like about misogyny and sexual exploits and abusing women. And, you know, it's no, no wonder that, you know, there's all these stories about members of M NWA hitting women, you know, um, shit like that, you know what I mean, so, um, but yeah, I mean, hypersexual, incredibly homophobic, all right, um, which also, you know, to be fair to gangster rap, like, almost all rap through a lot of the 90s um, was homophobic in, in nature, I mean, um, you know, when you talk about uh, effeminating people you think are inauthentic or corny or fake um, or 
you have a beef with or whatever, it's often involving, you know, um, you know, homophobic descriptions of them, you know, using, um, you know, homophobic slurs and stuff uh, in your lyrics, you know, uh, etc. You know, a lot of lyrics about drug dealing, drugs, um, drinking, uh, coming up, you know, um, you know, upward mobili mobility, getting out of the hood, uh, making making money, uh, having credibility in in the streets, um, you know, materialism, buying certain things, having certain things. So I'm looking at these kitties, probably off screen, wigging out. Um, you know, uh, early on, you know, a lot of the beats were real simple, uh, 808 stuff. So if we start with Schooly D, Ice T, and uh, uh, Easy E's, uh, Boys in the Hood, um, you know, shit like that. Very simple 808, sparse 808 beats, um, you know, but as it started to advance a little bit, specifically, um, you know, Dre um, and Sir Jinx, uh, Cold One Eighty Seven Home, um, etc., you know, um, they they get more complex, you know. The sam the sampling does, the layering, the beat making, the production technique. It starts to advance a little bit. Um, so this is just some of the gist general aesthetics, you know, uh, of the music it's, itself. Um, I always kind of ask, so you know, what what's the main difference between gangster rap and trap music? You know, and. Well, obviously, the music itself, right, the beats, um, although trap is primarily 808 beats, um, but, like, how they're arranged, where the snares hit, all that stuff, um, you know, the lyrical content, um, you know, I mean, trap music really is about, uh, about trap houses, you know, uh, uh, houses where drugs are, are you know, are sold, stored, whatever, you know, um, so, I mean, there's that theme, obviously, uh, misogyny, sex, dr drug abuse, drug using, you know, but less stuff about robbing, uh, less stuff about stealing, um, you know, no, I mean, I would, I would say that maybe some of the gangster rap stuff is a little bit more lyrical, um, in some ways, um,